that deals a lot on uh, on Jeff's talk, and uh, it is about worries and uh, things that uh, people like you and professionals should consider when doing group work in, in corporate finance. Uh, uh, let me just start saying that in the last 10, 15 years, a, no a number of interesting questions have uh, got our attention in corporate finance, different questions from what we had before. Things such as we're now looking more and more into what firms do in other countries to finance themselves. We are uh, trying to look at the interplay of various uh, financial decisions that firms make, such as acquisitions, uh, payout policy and capital structure in a more integrated way. We are also uh, looking, uh, paying attention to uh, source of financing that were overlooked. They existed, but somehow we never paid too much attention to them. Things such as lines of credit, cash, hedging, how they affect firm behavior. And uh, we're thinking about how managers look into joint decisions on the financial side and the real activities of the firms. And this goes on and on. We think about how laws affect firm behavior, and uh, how credit supply shocks uh, affect firms as well. This is work I'm doing on, on, the, on the current financial crisis, for instance. Uh, now, it is a great thing for you guys to uh, enter into the profession to go out there and try to find interesting uh, answers to those interesting questions. What is not great is, uh, and that's kind of building on, on Jeff's talk, uh, when you keep relying on methods that often lead to, or can lead to, misguided inferences. They not necessarily will lead to misguided inferences, but they might. Uh, you guys at the cutting edge of research should be aware and moving the research on this, on this topic forward. For a long time, uh, corporate finance researchers have, uh, have done a poor job of identifying how things influence one another. So we have done a poor job in uh, establishing cause and effects, and we deservedly received a rep bad reputation for doing, uh, for doing exactly that. Or as the pricing colleagues called our attention mostly on, on how bad sometimes it work on, on identification. Uh, so people still pay a lip service to, or you know, more so before, uh, to, to endogeneity and how to solve these issues. But at the end of the day, they end up uh, doing, playing the same old tricks of running regressions like stuff on stuff, or stuff on lack of stuff, <laughs> or stuff on poorly instrumented uh -huh. stuff. So as Jeff was saying, you get results. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you actually got uh, something that is meaningful, uh, and, uh, and that people actually believe in what you're saying. Some get comfort into the fact that uh, some results even get published sometimes. But you still won't get respect for publishing bad pa papers in good journals. People still know what you did. So it sticks with you and you should be very, very careful, especially when you are entering the profession like you guys are. So, uh, so identification has become a more serious issue uh, in public finance in, in recent years. And uh, I'd like to discuss a few technical approaches that people in the field should know. They are different, a different view, somehow different than uh, Jeff's with the same call for attention to what we do, careful work, uh, but the approach is somewhat different. Uh, my simple talk plan is the following. I will describe what challenges to causal inferences are, and we hear about causal inferences in, in science, and uh, then I'll discuss a subset of methods that one can use to deal with them. So one subset is the one that Jeff uh, 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 advocate and is advancing in, in a major way, work with uh, with Mike Lemon. Uh, uh, this one is somewhat different. I'll be talking about the Navy, random assignments, natural experiments, different, different estimators, matching estimators. Uh, this is kind of a part of a new wave of papers that uh, Mike Lemon is part of, uh, and I'm also working on, on the same topics that use these sort of approaches to get down to the issue of, uh, of uh, causation effects. Uh, that's less about quantitative, quantitative implications that we can get at but uh, it's, in a way, uh, easier to follow these approaches. Less, less structure, almost by definition, that you need to, uh, to get into causal effects using the approach I'm going to be talking about. So they don't resolve all issues. Uh, no, 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 no approach does, but they may help future work, maybe you guys' work going forward. So we're not, I'm going to be talking about instrumental variables and uh, some other designs which are quite interesting, but I don't have time to talk about them. Okay. So what is the fundamental problem of energy? In, in, in especially in corporate finance. Uh, the problem is that we uh, look at firms and they typically carry out actions, say, call it D, and they do so anticipating some outcome Y. And, uh, and they also have to consider some, some unobserved factor Z may uh, drive both D and Y. So you see in red there the problems that comes about when you look at this data. The problem that we face in corporate finance is that we deal with uh, of its original data. So this is data that comes to us, it's presented naturally to us, and we use it. We don't, we don't, are, we're not able to make that data happen. We cannot do experiments. And when we do we work with, with original data, 
what happens is that all the problems that I cite there in red, uh, they appear and sometimes, oftentimes, all at once. And in the context of regression analysis, uh, which is basically we, we most of the time use, uh, the problem that we have when we do a regression of, of y on d and try to make you know, inferences is that uh, an endogeneity will arise for any correlation between uh, d and the residual of this regression, u, and any of the factors I described there will cause it, even more so. There are other, other factors as well I'm not covering here. And this bias may lead us to make uh, wrong inferences about defect of D on, on I, say a corporate governance system uh, that the, the firm chooses to, uh, <coughs> to adopt. Okay. Now, so research dealing with uh, these designs, uh, are, are, these problems are found in other fields of science as well, but in other fields they are actually uh, doing different approaches uh, to the problem and I think we're kind of learning with them. I have a, a less negative view about medical science than Jeff has. So in, in, in biology and medicine, researchers are often able to conduct what's called controlled experiments. They uh, basically assign uh, subjects randomly to uh, treatment and control groups, and they are able to uh, tackle questions such as, you know, does smoking causes cancer? Does eating fat causes obesity? We know there's correlation, as, as Jeff was talking about, uh, but there, is there any causation effects there? So if it is, this would be as if, as if we could uh, send firms to assign randomly firms to proper, maybe proper government systems A and B, uh, despite of their wishes, we don't, is it, it could have, uh, preclude them from choosing what they like to do. And then we can look into the cause and effects of uh, systems A and B, we can compare them. Now, statistical methods, once you have that, if you were able to do that, the statistical methods that we need to do are actually not really sophisticated. They're very simple. You can get a cause of relations with very simple approaches. Basically, you can just compare the outcome variable of interest across the treated and control units I'm basically talking about you can perform, nearly perform a, a simple differences of uh, uh, mean for the two groups. So I'll be talking about interesting, there's an interesting language that comes with this approach to endogeneity. Uh, random assignments, treatment and control groups, potential outcomes. And this language is, is what's a part of uh, what's called the treatment <coughs> effects framework. Let me just give you a couple slides on this and, uh, and then we say, uh, then trying to make it in a way such that we apply this framework into problems in finance and corporate finance. So suppose we observe two variables uh, from a certain population, D and Y. The question is, does uh, uh, D causes Y? Okay, so what's D? D uh, is a treatment status, okay? uh, a choice. Uh, a firm unit uh, equals one, D equals one if the unit receives treatment and zero if it did not receive treatment. Y, D is a potential outcome. Uh, so with the treatment status and potential outcome, so the label I was talking about. Uh, Y1 is the outcome for the firm or the unit that took the treatment, and Y0 is the one uh, outcome for the unit that did not take the treatment. Okay? So every unit has both treated and untreated potential outcomes. But the problem with, with the data that we observe, instead of uh, uh, manipulate, uh, is that uh, only one of the outcomes can be observed. Okay? Either you took the pill or you didn't take the pill. Uh, and uh, this is an expression for uh, what we see uh, in the outcome variable there. So what's the problem of causal interest? Let's, let's find what causal effect is, and then you say, why do we have a problem there? So a causal effect is, uh, for an individual Y, is the, uh, we say there's a causal effect. If the treatment DI has a causal effect on the outcome Y, uh, if the event D equals one, instead of D equals zero, implies I, Y equals one, Y one, instead of Y equals Y zero. So the cause effect of D on, on Y is this gain that you have uh, from moving from the non-treatment effect situation to a treatment uh, status. Uh, the fundamental problem of color inference is that uh, it is impossible to observe for the same individual D equals one and D equals zero as well as y, uh, y one and Y zero. And therefore it's impossible to observe the effect of D uh, on individual I. Now, <coughs> the, uh, 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 this impossibility comes from the fact that uh, you cannot establish a cause of effect because you cannot observe uh, what, the, what the outcome on the treated individual would be had you not uh, taken the, the treatment. Okay, so this makes it impossible to, uh, to create a counterfactual. Now, not always lost, we actually have some things to say still. We can talk about average treatment effects. So we cannot pin down the effect on the individual, but we can talk about averages at least. Okay? 
and therefore we can evaluate policies based on that, how on average individuals are affected by some policy. So there are some definitions that we can think about. Uh, one is so, it's called the average treatment effect, the ATE, uh, which is the average gain from taking the treatment, uh, comparing, uh, simply comparing the averages of uh, uh, outcomes for those who uh, are treated and non-treated. Uh, that's not the most interesting one. The most interesting uh, approach is to uh, so-called the ATG, the average treatment effect on the treated, which is the gain from treatment for those individuals that actually took the treatment. And this is the expression that we get there. It's, it's very simple, and uh, the notes will be available on the web. You can take a look at uh, for more details. Now, the ATE is the easier one, uh, the effect of, of, uh, of the treatment on the random individual. So it is uninteresting, though. That's just a problem with this question. This is something like, uh, if we're a job, uh, the effects of a, of a job a training program, you don't want to know what the effect is on millionaires. You don't really care. They are not the focus of policy. Or you don't care about the effect of diversification on a small shop, if you talk about corporate finance. The more interesting uh, effect that we, do, we, we, take, you know, we, we look at is uh, the ATT, in which, people, uh, in which we measure the effect of policy uh, on, on individuals which are on the margin. Uh, policy on individuals who, for which uh, 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 the, the, uh, the uh, policy may be benefit or not, or different number. Okay, not just any average individual, any single, uh, random individual. The problem with ATT is this unobserved uh, element it has up here, okay, uh, which is the outcome of the treatment unit at the non-treatment baseline. Basically, is the, the one outcome that we don't see. There could be a reason why uh, the uh, individual took uh, the treatment uh, precisely to avoid uh, some outcome uh, without the treatment. So the, uh, the, the treatment effect, uh, uh, the fact that the treatment effect is chosen by the individual when you look at the observational data uh, may lead to a selection bias uh, because people are di different, there's heterogeneity in those choices. And so how do we deal with that? So that's not, uh, that's not, not, not make, doesn't really help us understand uh, cause effects. Now, to get an unbiased estimate of the, uh, of the treatment effect, you need to uh, work on randomization. You need to get rid of the selection biases. Okay, so basically, if we randomize our choices, if we do not allow uh, individuals or firms to make their choices, but instead tell, tell them what to do, we can get rid of the uh, of the selection problem and basically uh, make uh, the outcomes uh, be independent of the uh, treatment status. And if you do that, uh, you can uh, you do have that the uh, the outcome of the treated uh, the treated individual at the baseline of no treatment becomes equal to the outcome of the non-treated at the baseline, and you get rid of the endogeneity uh, problem we were just talking about before. Okay. So the same selection problem disappears, and that's a lot of the result. Randomization solves the problem of causal difference, uh, and therefore compare the treatments of uh, treated and non-treated in the ATE style, which is the easy one, uh, gives you the ATT, which is the one that you actually care about. You just compare units uh, that are uh, treated and non-treated and treated as other factors. Problem is that randomization rarely occurs in finance. Okay. Firms do change do choose a the policy they want to implement, and there's a D there, and uh, they do so anticipating some outcome Y. So it's hard to talk about uh, an orthogonal independent effect on the, the, the choice of treatment or policy on, uh, on outcome. Okay. Now, all is not lost though. So what do we do in corporate finance? So one way in which you do these things of uh, randomization is to look for uh, something called natural experiments. And there's a number of, of successful papers using natural experiments these days. Uh, and the idea there is that you look for isolated changes in one aspect of the environment, the economic environment, as if it was uh, an experiment. Uh, some change that can be uh, uh, deemed as independent of, say, firm choices or anticipation of, of, of outcomes. So the idea is that you assume that everything else has uh, a constant. So there's some studies using natural events, uh, biological, twins, People look at twins, uh, geography, earthquakes, meteors. I actually made up the meteors, so there's no meteors, but there is earth earthquakes. <laughs> and uh, and we can look also at interventions, th things such as uh, industry deregulation, tax reforms, end of tariffs, uh, changing in rates of classification, oil shocks, unanticipated financial uh, nuclear tests that uh, actually happened in the industry paper, and a financial crisis. So that I'm not making this one up. Now. If we can identify, uh, the, the test that you can the go with when you look into this, this approach is that uh, you are less, perhaps less interested in the model of the firm, but you are very much interested in the institutional uh, surroundings that lead to the, 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 uh, the event. 
uh, if it's a deregulation move, you need to think about uh, you need to think about uh, was anticipated was made of uh, because of lobbying in the industry. And if, if you can assume those things are fairly uh, uh, independent, then you have a good uh, way of randomization. Okay. Now, uh, natural experiments are particularly interesting when you can uh, apply this, what's called different different estimation. When there is a set of, sub uh, of subjects at time zero before the treatment that were not uh, uh, that, that, that were exposed to the treatment, uh, and uh, and but some that is not exposed to the treatment. So at some time zero, they're the same. At time one, some are exposed, some are not exposed to treatment, and you can create in that way a set of counterfactuals. Uh, if you're lucky enough, you can even do a diff and diff and diff, and you create an you know, even greater set of counterfactuals there. And, uh, and in, in this way, we carefully isolate the effect of causation, uh, but you know, this requires a lot of knowledge of the institutional settings that we're talking about. So it's not, it's not that easy, but this is one way in which new papers are dealing with randomization of uh, of, uh, of effects on 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 undeveloped public finance. So let me skip the model there. I think you you know this one, and again you can see them in the in the notes, of course, in the web. Uh, so in contrast to other uh, methods such as IV or even the structural method methods that uh, Jeff was talking about, uh, the definitive death design uh, is interesting in the sense that uh, uh, you don't worry about exclusion restrictions. You don't worry about including covariates in the regression. Uh, or in the model, uh, and uh, in, you don't even worry about modeling the equation of the outcome of interest. Okay. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, potential draw, draw, drawbacks or faults with this approach is that uh, you need to uh, have some assumptions about uh, the effect of the macro change that happens from one time to another time. It needs to have, uh, it cannot allow the, uh, the change in the macro environment to have a differential effect uh, on the treated and untreated units for any reason other than the treatment effect. Okay, so uh, you have to, to have something called the constant trend. And uh, that could be also an observed time variant components that change the exposure of individuals over time to the treatment. And that exposure may be uh, uh, self-selected too. So, uh, so also the natural experiments that we have in finance, you have to be careful with them because they're not really true, really true lab experiments. They can be misguided, lead to misguided inferences because things such as change in an industry environment such as the regulation are, we can call it treatment, and that's nice, sounds random, but many times they are anticipated, they are a, a result of lobbying, uh, or expedient people are using these days, is, is something called matching estimators. I'm not going to be able to give a lecture on matching estimators, but uh, the idea is that you can build on, uh, on these estimators also to resolve issues that are left unresolved by the different uh, approach. And uh, the matching estimator is something that is, uh, that you should use, or you can think about using when control randomization is impossible, and uh, you have a natural experiment, and it's not quite exactly convincing. So the MEs, my transmitters, rely on the assumption of something called selection on observable. So you do need to uh, assume uh, that you have, uh, that you know the, 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 the reason why uh, individuals would or would not participate uh, in the treatment effect. And sometimes that's the questionable question, that the question of assumption that you have, you have to. To, to go for. Uh, once, you, once you know that, then, uh, then the treatment uh, status become random and you can talk again about, uh, about the, 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 the matter of causation. So if you have a, uh, a reasonable natural experiment uh, and you know variables that may be influencing some residual decision into the treatment and the outcome that you see, uh, and you can use those variables, then you have, you're back to the game of, uh, of potentially uh, making statements about cause and effects. Okay. So natural uh, matching estimators are interesting in the sense that they kind of replicate what the an experiment will look like, a lab experiment will look like. So they don't really quite do it, but they kind of, the idea is to get close to that. So uh, the observations that you use to estimate the cause and effects under uh, matching estimators are chosen without reference to the outcome. So there's a first stage step in which you, you basically only care about selecting uh, the pairs that you'll be using without looking at the outcome. We don't have to do that. Uh, the, uh, the, to the, the focus on the, on the treatment under the matching estimator, uh, we don't need to worry about a full theoretically correct model uh, of the firm, which is you know, a different than the, from the approach that uh, Jeff was, uh, was, was discussing. Uh, this is more model free in, in that way. Uh, once you identify what you're looking for, it becomes more model free. Uh, in practice, these models, anyways, as Jeff was saying, because I'm a critic to all that, 
they are typically uh, implemented uh, through a very simple linear form of a much more complex theory, and they may lead to, uh, to obvious biases. Once you do the game of, in the game of simplifying a complex model into an OLS regression, then you have to get into the game of having predictive power for the OLS regression, uh, or, and you have the issues such as parametric models that are, uh, can deal too well with, uh, with uh, uh, outliers and, and nonlinearities. So the imaging estimator, in a way, it's interesting. It's a non-parametric approach in which you don't have to worry about, about uh, such concerns. Uh, it's a case-by-case -case matching uh, in a particular version of it uh, in which you basically don't care about outliers uh, and, uh, and you can at the same time have a very complicated nonlinear uh, model uh, that, that is accounts for full interaction of every element you think is interesting uh, in your problem. Okay. And you don't need to worry about things such as well-behaved moments of all the variables. So there's a, a long list of uh, interesting things of why uh, uh, matching estimators lead to uh, more careful uh, comparisons between the, the treatment effects and non-treatment effects of units, and therefore allow us to get a better sense of the economics of the, of the treatment effects. I'm going to skip uh, some examples I have here. Let me just go, since I have one minute, let me go straight to my concluding slide. So the final word I have is that, uh, so I went through a huge exercise, and you start with a problem, there's a there's an issue that you need to resolve, uh, you use expedience to, use to, to, uh, to address it, uh, and you get as, as close as you can uh, to something that's cleaner, closer to uh, an experiment in which you vary just one element of the, uh, the economic environment and look into the outcome uh, uh, of, of, that, of that change. Uh, but the, the question, the final word for you guys is that this is just an exercise. There's other ways in which I could do the same presentation. Uh, the idea is that you need to be very careful, think uh, very carefully about what you are doing. Uh, just don't get a result and run away with it thinking this is fantastic. Uh, believe me, referees will come back to you and be asking those questions. Uh, and uh, even, like I said before, even if you publish them, you don't want to be known for uh, results that don't stand the test of time. Uh, the simple moral of the story is that you have to, if you decide to be a good empiricist, you want to be a, the best that you can be. Uh, you want to, uh, to know the new methodologies. In science, we always, uh, you know, always worry about, or concerned about uh, inferences that, that can lead us to causal uh, causal uh, statements. And, uh, and, and the ways in which you do this, the tools that we use keep evolving, and your job as entering the profession is to be on top of the game. You need to be ahead of the curve. Uh, clearly, you need to be asking interesting questions. That's, of course, that's the basic, the most important thing. Ask a, a big, interesting question. Uh, I said it before, there are many new questions in corporate finance. They are very, very interesting. You need to, to uh, find the newest, interesting question. But uh, your work needs to be solid on the dimensions I discussed. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, you need to be uh, helping, be thinking about helping uh, theory and policy making. This is really a distinguished uh, fi feature of global economic finance is when you can actually make uh, suggestions or statements uh, that may help back the theories or the policy uh, makers. Okay. So ask interesting questions, find new data sources, very important. You have to be entrepreneurial in global finance. Use state-of-the-art tools, tools, put all of this together in a clever way, and uh, that's a uh, in my view, a path for success in this area.